Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to r slash malicious compliance, where people get exactly what they deserve. And in this episode, OP's dumb boss fires him, only to beg him to come back to work when he realizes that the place is on fire. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's super satisfying stories. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't. And remember, story submissions can be sent to this email right here. So this is my grandmother's story. My family's been telling this tale for decades. Grandpa himself told it to his daughter's fiancé as a lesson in not underestimating his new bride. Grandma told it slightly different to my mom when she and my father were engaged. This is somewhere between the two versions. It's a lesson in be careful what you wish for as you might just get it. Personally, I've always thought this story was hilarious. So my grandparents were very old school. Grandpa got a job working for John Deere as a teen, and he worked way up the ladder to become foreman, then manager. Grandma was a typical housewife in the 1950s, and was held to typical housewife standards. She was to cook and clean and be prepared to entertain Grandpa's business associates at a moment's notice. It was also her job to make sure the children were taken care of, and never got in her husband's way. She was expected to have dinner on the table at 5.30 sharp when he got home from work. Her house and herself were to be impeccably kept at all times, etc, etc. They were progressive and well off enough that grandma had her own car. She was expected to use it to run household errands, to take the four kids to appointments and such. It was important that her husband not be bothered with such things. The household and family were her responsibility, as he had a job. Well, one day, grandpa arrives home from work. And not only was dinner not on the table, but grandma wasn't even there. The kids who were teens at the time hadn't been fed, and their homework was still on the kitchen table. There were unwashed dishes in the sink, and a dozen other little chores that hadn't been done yet. Most importantly, grandpa was inconvenienced. He'd been home just long enough to let his frustration stew into anger when grandma's car pulls up into the driveway. He then begins shouting at her before she even had the chance to set down her purse and take off her jacket. He rants about all the things she hadn't done because she was out running around when she should have been home taking care of the house and making his dinner. He told her he worked very hard all day to provide for the family, and was it too much to ask for a hot dinner when he got home. She had a very good reason for not being home, but he never let her tell it, accepting no excuses. But she was a good wife, so she intended to let him vent for a while, and then she would serve him supper and explain what had gone wrong. And then Grandpa screwed up. Now as sometimes happens when we speak in anger, he began to blame the wrong thing for his irritation. He began to blame the car and her access to it. He said something along the lines of, You don't have any business out driving around anyway. You should be home. I should have never let you start driving in the first place. Women shouldn't drive. At that, Grandma then asked calmly, you don't want me to drive, retrieving her keys from her purse. She then says, fine, I won't ever drive again. She then set her car keys on the counter, put her things away, and then served dinner. And bless her heart, Grandma stuck with that declaration no matter how much more difficult it made life. Grandpa had to take afternoons off in the middle of the week when a teacher scheduled a meeting. He didn't get a moment's peace on the weekends, between grocery trips and taking kids to activities or doctor's appointments or for haircuts or clothes. And he had to drive grandma to every Saturday salon appointment. Previously, grandma had taken herself and the kids to church, letting him sleep. Now he had to wake up early on Sundays to take them all himself. Now, a thing about grandpa was that he's as stubborn as his wife. He held out, expecting her to apologize and ask for her keys back, but she never did. Instead, she simply rearranged the household schedule so that he could handle all the driving. So months later, after never getting a single weekend to relax, and after having dinner pushed back nearly every day because he had to drive someone someplace, he finally gave in and apologized. Now, he tried to tell her that he was wrong and that she should start driving again. He tried to tell her that he appreciated all she did to make his life easier. He all but begged her to take those keys back. Now, I suspect that Grandma had always disliked driving because she never did take back those keys. Nothing Grandpa said or did could convince her to get back behind the wheel. He said she had no business driving a car and she was going to hold him to that declaration, no matter what. So for over 50 years, until the day she died, Grandma never drove a car again, for any reason. Not after the kids graduated and moved out, and not after Grandpa retired. 
Even after Grandpa's death in the 80s, she still refused to drive because, quote, My husband always said that women shouldn't drive. Guys, I love this malicious compliance so much. And I love how petty Grandma got. Like, not driving for 50 years just to inconvenience your husband is god-level petty. And this person says, My granddad said something similar to my gran, and she went out and got herself a motorbike. Okay, so my dad was visiting us for Christmas. And as usual, I got him to share some stories about his youth, and he shared a time where he used a malicious compliance to not only shut up one of his bosses, but to get him in trouble. So many years ago, back when dad was a college student, he earned extra money for living by working at a car manufacturing plant. The state at the time was a closed shop, which meant he had to join a union to work, unless you were in an executive position. So one of the rules said union set up at dad's workplace was that no employee could work certain positions unless they had been trained for it. This included positions such as forklift operator and trash compactor. This was included in the contract and was a no-break rule. So enter George, the manager. Made up name. Unlike many in this thread, George was actually a nice fellow, but to quote Joseph from It's a Wonderful Life, he has the IQ of a jackrabbit and didn't always think things through. So one Saturday afternoon, Dad comes into work and George pulls him aside and says, Hey, I need you to do me a favor, son. The trash compactor is jammed and I need someone to crawl in and unjam it. You're the smallest of us, so it shouldn't be a problem for you. Now, not only had Dad not been trained for loading the compactor, but even he knew that crawling in there would be a dumb idea. So he says, uh, George, I haven't been trained for this position. Hearing that, George gets all flustered and he tells him, just do it. Dad then gets an idea for some malicious compliance. He says, I'll do it, but is it okay if I ask one of the other guys to spot me to make sure I don't get squashed? At that, George says, that'll be fine. Just make sure the job is done. So with that said, Dad then heads to the union shop leader, named Kenny. Like George, Kenny was a decent fellow, but he was very protective of his workers. Dad then told Kenny what happened and asked him to spot him. Cue Kenny turning at least five shades of purple before storming into George's office. Dad told me the whole floor went silent, as Kenny unloaded on George for trying to make a poor college kid do something so effing dangerous, and that this will be recorded and written up. Kenny then stormed out, leaving a frightened George quaking in his steel-toed boots. The compactor did end up getting fixed, without someone crawling into it, and George always asked if people were trained for positions before asking them to do it in the future. Guys, all I can say is thank freaking goodness that there's people like Kenny out there, because he very well could have saved OP's dad that day. Guys, crawling into a trash compactor with no formal training as the new guy is 100% a no-no. And reading this post, I was reminded of a really sad story about a guy getting crushed to death on his first day of work because of improper training. So yeah, if you're ever working and you feel like the job is too dangerous, just remember you have the right to refuse dangerous work, guys. And worst case, if they fire you for it, which they legally can't, it's way better to lose a job than to lose your life. So this was around 10 years ago. I've always been very technical minded and was able to read blueprints, construct complex devices, weld, and other things. I took a high paying job with a company that made several things for railroads. The job entailed most of my skills I mentioned above. It was a very small department. In fact, there were only two to three of us. But we got along great, and we challenged each other, which led to higher production. Sadly, one of the other guys in my department left for a better job, which left me by myself. My supervisor was great as well. He liked to joke around with me, left me alone to focus on my work, and had my back when I needed him. We actually assembled signal enclosures and mast and ladder houses for railroads. Fast forward three years later, and the owners buy a much bigger location and move the whole company. As you might expect, several departments get shuffled, and my department gets folded into a completely different department that has no clue what I do. At first, it was fine, but it starts to go pear-shaped pretty quickly. My supervisor seemed good at first, but I quickly realized that he's a snake in the grass. For example, I had to help the prototype department assemble a new lighter type of mast and ladder house. So I'm printing out issues and suggesting fixes, etc. And the supervisor's not happy. He keeps coming over huffing, groaning under his breath, standing over my shoulder, etc, etc. The guy finally interrupts me and asks in an angry voice, Hey, how much longer will this take? I responded, I have four more hours today and eight hours every day after that. 
He then looks puzzled, so I explained, this is my department and this is where I work. These are my responsibilities, so if it takes two months, that's how long it takes. Now almost as if to get the last word in, he says, you will work where and when I tell you, and storms off. The next day, I'm called into the office and they force me to sign a letter that states I now work with my new supervisor, in his department. Now that's fine by me. I watch from a distance in my new department as all the stock, hardware, parts, orders, etc, etc of my old department begin to rack up. And since I'm the only one that works in that department, or rather used to work in that department, nobody's doing a thing about it. After about two weeks, my old department is a disaster, with items being thrown wherever it would fit. Orders began to miss deadlines and higher-ups wanted answers, and sure enough, I get called into the office where the new supervisor blames me for everything. The guy wouldn't let me get a word in. Of course, they let me go without any reason or paperwork. The look of relief on my new ex-supervisor's face when I walk out was priceless. He had no clue what was coming. I leave with a smile plastered to my face, because I knew something they didn't. I was the only one that knew how to build the mast and ladder structures. So with that, I relaxed at home for around two weeks, because I knew I'd be getting a call from them. I ignore the first dozen calls, and then I answer, and they say, can you come back and build, train new hires, etc, etc for your department? At that I say, sure, I can do it for $20,000. Now that might seem like it was a lot, but it wasn't, they made millions from these. So there was really only one option, to pay me $20,000 or lose millions of dollars. Long story short, they went back and forth with me, but they finally conceded. I received $20,000 for two days of work, and they were helpless. The cherry on top was that my new ex-supervisor was fired for being a nitwit and costing the company $20,000. Guys, I absolutely love the stories where stupid bosses fire employees, only to find out that said employee is the only one who knows how things work. Like, talk about power tripping like a little kid, right? No, you work for me in my department. This isn't your department anymore, OP. It's also no longer yours anymore, sir. Okay, so this story happened in the early 2000s when I was working for my uncle's fencing company. So customer A purchased a newly constructed home. It was a cookie cutter home. Everything builder, great. The land plots were divided only by fluorescent orange marking spray paint. Hardly official. So my uncle submitted a bid per customer A's request and we got the project. We had the lowest bid, around $1,200 lower than the competition. The caveat was we collect full payment up front. Not a deal breaker for customers, as we accept credit card payments. During that time, my uncle had just left his previous job as a land surveyor, and his specialty was property line surveying. So the estimated property line, marked by the above-mentioned orange spray paint, was nearly two feet off on one side of customer A's property. My uncle makes the necessary adjustments and markings, and we start digging the post holes. Customer A makes a surprising job site visit and inspection. He sees our post holes and he turns beet red. He then rushes towards us and starts dropping F-bombs left and right, saying, What the F are you idiots doing? You are giving away part of my property to my effing neighbor. Can't you effing effers see the bright orange mark on the effing dirt? I want you geniuses to fill up these holes ASAP and dig right where the orange lines are. I want my fence directly on top of the orange lines. Now, hearing him scream at us, I just about lost it, and I was about to get in his face. My uncle stops me, and he tries to explain, saying, Hey, the orange lines are off, and that's when the customer interrupts him and says, Hey, I'm the one paying here, not you, so you follow my effing directions. Again, my uncle tries and says, Hey, please let me explain. And he says, No, 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 no. I have paid you in full. You are not paid to explain. You are paid to build my fence exactly the way I want it, where I want it. This effing conversation is over. So with that, he then drives off and my uncle looks at me with a malicious smile. He says, OP, let's grab an early lunch and we will give him what he wants. At that I shrug. So over lunch, he calls my aunt, his secretary, to have her draft up a new work order contract. In it, it's explicitly and officially noted that the fence will be erected 22 inches east of the official property line, and that the customer will shoulder full responsibility and liability should a conflict arise, either with their future new neighbor or any other party. 
My aunt emails the contract to customer A, and my uncle and I have our two martini lunch hour. My aunt then calls me and says the idiot has signed and emailed the new contract back to her. And now we have a paper trail, so we go back to the site and continue working. That same afternoon, the guy pays us another visit and says, Hey, I'm just checking to see if you decided to follow my instructions. You idiots didn't wait for me to sign the new contract before resuming work, did you? I tell him, we sure did. As he turned around to leave, I can hear him mouthing something saying, effing idiots. Upon completion three days later, he signs off that the work was satisfactory. The guy was still an a-hole, refusing to acknowledge my uncle or I when we thanked him for his business. So four months later, he contacts my uncle again, requesting for him to bid on a new project. And yep, you guessed it, to move the existing fence on top of the official property line. We gave him an unreasonably high bid and still secured the project. This time around, he was a teddy bear throughout the entire project. See, this is why a lot of people need to just shut up and listen to what others have to say. Like, if he wasn't too busy shouting over the uncle, he would have probably found out that the uncle specialized in surveying property lines. And I'm glad he paid some idiot tax, though. Okay, some background. I'm a 39-year-old female, and I live in a housing cooperative. I have no idea if there's something equivalent in other countries, but I live in Norway. It's essentially where you own your own apartment, but the cooperative owns the buildings and the land. I've lived here for 10 years without a single complaint, and Karen is the new building manager. Being the Karen she is, she's a highly narcissistic female. So where I live, if you're going to make changes to the building, you have to apply for a permit. Otherwise, it's generally do as you please, as long as you don't bother your neighbors. Anyways, I put up a small greenhouse on my private patio, as many others have done, but not this exact type. This was an aluminum construction, not a frame with a loose plastic cover kind. The building manager, who's best described as a triple Karen, threw a fit. Now, she actually watched me spend three days assembling the greenhouse, then the day it was finished, she called me throwing a fit. Now, it wasn't because I put up a greenhouse, but because I'd used screws to fasten it to the patio for stability. Apparently, I wasn't allowed to use screws on the floorboards, as this was considered changes to the building in her mind and I had destroyed the floorboards. Never mind the whole patio was built with, wait for it, screws through the floorboards. Now screws in the walls were okay, she told me, in my response to me asking why she'd put up shelves on the patio herself, but not the floorboards. Apparently the difference was monumental, and everybody should know this. Now nowhere, literally nowhere does it say that fastening things to floorboards or putting screws in the floorboards is not allowed. Not in the house rules, not in my contract, and not in the National Housing Cooperative's law. But Karen was furious that I'd done this, so I take a deep breath, and as I'm quite creative, I immediately thought of a workaround. I'll just put it on wheels then. So I made a big number of saying that fastening was essential, because otherwise, the greenhouse would not be stable enough to withstand wind. Karen said she understood this, but I had ruined the co-op's property, and this was really a serious matter. She then told me to send in an application for a permit to see if she could find a way to get approval from the board. But she couldn't guarantee that I could keep it, she said, with the fakest of sympathies. So I sent the application, with photos saying what I'd done, and that I didn't think I had to apply to do it, as I never considered putting in a prefabricated greenhouse would be seen as changes to the building. So my application was rejected, as I anticipated, but she worded the rejection exactly as I hoped she would. I was not allowed to put in a fastened greenhouse, and she probably thought she'd been clever when she included that I was not allowed to put the greenhouse on my front lawn either. Now, I had worked the it needs to be fastened to be stable angle hard, because I hoped she, as the Karen she is, would fall for that reverse psychology. So I proceeded to put the greenhouse on wheels. I made a frame from 2x4s and put 8 small furniture wheels under the frame. I then lifted and screwed the greenhouse onto the frame. I then put some boards on the sides just above the ground to stop the draft. And boom, I have a mobile greenhouse. I can slide it all over the patio. I then put some hooks in the walls and used transport straps to secure the whole thing to the wall for stability. As the walls were okay to put screws in, remember? So in effect, my greenhouse is now in the exact same location, only it's 4 inches taller and with ugly blue ribbons tying it to the wall. And now the patio has 22 open screw holes, ready to be filled with rainwater in the fall. But oh well, as she's repeatedly told me, it's not my patio. 
I then sent an orientation email to the building manager, with photos and videos of the sliding greenhouse. With the rest of the board members on copy, I explained in detail what I'd done, and how every step was in compliance with the rejection email I received, which I of course included. I said the greenhouse was now considered a piece of mobile patio furniture, just like my sofa and chairs were, and that I now considered the subject to be a closed matter. I haven't heard a single word from any of them, and it's been over a week. I think I got her. I can't imagine she'll find a loophole that lets her legally dictate what patio furniture is allowed and what isn't allowed in the co-op, since the patios are stated to be for every apartment owner's private usage. So when Christmas comes, I'm planning to decorate the greenhouse with lights, to make it pretty because every time Karen steps out of her front door, she has to face my patio where she's looking straight at my greenhouse. The least I could do is make it pretty for her, right? And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's satisfying stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, I'll link it right here. A new neighbor moves into Opie's apartment and acts like she owns the whole freaking building. It's such a crazy story, so go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.